Down to London to go and record this, which is pretty cool. Yeah, to Discovery Headquarters. Yeah, which was which was different. It was like Silicon Valley. Walking in there, it was a part of London I'd never been to, and it was sort of all the big tech companies all in one place. Yeah, it's pretty That's tech and film actually, because Disney was opposite us too. Yeah, they were. It's pretty cool. I don't travel to London very often, and uh, in fact, that was the second time I've been in London in a month, and I, before that, it had been ten years. I think. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I don't really. Not many reasons. Not many reasons to go other than, and when you're flying, I try and avoid it. Yeah, so do I. I normally try and skip straight from Scotland out of the country if I'm flying abroad. If possible, or if you can, Gatwick Airport. Gatwick seems to be okay. If you go through Heathrow, there's a good chance you might never see your luggage. <laughs> <laughs> or or you might never fly yourself. So we were down um, down there in London, Discovery, to meet Leveson Wood. Yes. And we've, we mentioned a couple of podcasts ago that we were going to go down and meet him and talk about his new show, um, Arabia. With Levison Wood, uh, it's been I've I've been seeing it popping up everywhere. Yeah. In fact, as this podcast is being recorded, only a few hours ago, he was on BBC Breakfast, ah. uh, talking about his new show, which airs I think the day after this comes out. Yeah. So this will be going out on Wednesday and the Thursday, the twenty seventh of June, twenty nineteen, uh, will be the first uh, episode dropping on Discovery Channel. But I think uh, the time and everything is discussed in the podcast. Yes. No, Le- Levison gives us the the exact time. Uh, and so essentially most of this, a lot of this podcast is going to be about his new series. But we do dive back into his history and find out how he got to where he was and touch on a few of his previous adventures. And he has many. Oh, it's it's crazy. If If you just had one, you know, like... 10% of his life than you would have seen in a lot of the world. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he's well known, but he deserves to be a lot more well known than he is because he, he should be an absolute household name with what he is, has done and achieved. So if you have Discovery, let us know uh, when you go and watch it. Yeah. Let us give us some what feedback. What, what did you think? We have seen the first show. We were, we're lucky enough to go and get a preview of uh, episode one. So uh, as the episodes come out, we will carry on watching them. And uh, yeah, we'd love to know what your, your thoughts are. And so, uh, give uh, give Levison uh, some feedback on the show. Yeah. On I'd, his Instagram. Do that. And when you listen to this podcast um, with him, stick it up on your Instagram story or your Instagram tag feed or your both. Facebook. Tag us both. Yeah. That would be great. So yeah, very excited to bring this to you. Uh, we're going to keep this intro from us very short because... I'm ill. That's why. Uh, well, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the main reason, but Daryl is a bit ill. That's why he was blowing into the mic uh, like a maniac a minute ago. Horrendous. Honestly. It's from planes. I, well, ever since my... I, I'm convinced. Ever since my... Oh, here we go. No, ever since my accident, I have not been ill for a very, very long time. And I've been ill about three or four times since my accident, which is a year ago now. Uh, and before that, it'd been it'd been before I was in the navy. I'd been ill, and I think it's because of I just was so ill. I think that's what it is. And then some person on the plane gave me the lurgy. Gave you lurgy. And it's also because I'm not around people much, which I yeah. kind of like. Because yeah, we're always in the middle of nowhere. Because <laughs> we're always in the middle of nowhere, and not catching lurgy from people. So as soon as you get on the plane, that's when you get the the zombie Bad virus. Bad juju. Yeah. We have two competition winners uh, from two weeks ago. We ha- gave everyone the opportunity to win. The latest edition of the Hornady reloading manual, and we it was a simple case of tagging a friend below. No, no, it wasn't. Sorry, that was a different competition. All we wanted to do uh, to know from you was where do you like to buy your outdoors or hunting gear? And um, Rod Entwistle likes to use St Boswell's gun room, which I used to use all the time when I lived down the borders. So congratulations, Rod. You are the winner of the Hornady reloading manual, the latest edition. Send us your details, and we will get that out to you. Do we have another company? We do. So, oh, this in, is the Modern Huntsman Yeah, one, so uh, two weeks ago we announced that, uh, that our podcast is going to be collaborating in partnership with Modern Huntsman going forward. Uh, in fact, 
And the extended part of this intro is a 20 minute section with none other than Tyler Sharp telling you all about Volume 3, which is right now going out to everybody in the States. And is that going to be after or before the Leveson? It's going to be before. Before. Okay. Before. Um, so all the copies of Modern Huntsman Volume 3 are going out to the people in the States as we record this. And in about two weeks' time, uh, they'll be, or less than two weeks, hopefully, they'll all be going out to everybody who's ordered in the rest of the world. Boom. There you go. So, but Tyler, I'm not going to expand any more on it because... I've not even heard it yet, so I'll have to learn about it when uh, <laughs> when we edit... Well, I'm not editing the No, show. I'm editing it. Um, but Tyler talks all about the partnership uh, with the podcast and what you can expect to find in Volume 3, and that'll be coming as soon as we, we wrap up our intro here. Yeah. Um, but... In conjunction with that, two weeks ago, we gave you the chance to win a copy of Volume 3. And all we wanted you to do with social media is just tag a friend in below. So both on Facebook uh, and on Instagram. And we've randomly selected somebody. Uh, it happened to be from Instagram. And the Instagram account is the Hunter Panorama. So congratulations. All you've got to do is contact us and we will make sure that as soon as the, everyone else gets their copies of Volume 3, it also gets shipped out to you. So the next Modern Huntsman competition, because it's one a month. I mean, yep. It is. No, no, it's one a show. One a show? Yes. Oh, so we're giving out another one for this show. too good to the people listening. Way too good. I don't even have a copy yet. No. <laughs> uh, so what are we doing for this well, one? I was hoping you were about to tell me. Oh, okay. I think so. uh, to keep the momentum, and because so many people entered this, and because it's literally just landing on people's doorsteps right now, we're going to basically do the same thing. We'll stick up some different pictures, and just Fro we'll stick up a picture from the from the magazine. That's yeah. what we'll do. Uh, and you'll just have to tag a friend below who yeah. you think would also appreciate Volume Three on uh, on, on, on Instagram on and Instagram. on Facebook, yeah. and we will randomly select somebody again in two weeks' time. Easy, done. Um, did we decide what we were giving away in terms of kit? Uh, well, yeah, we are a, a baseball cap that we are running towards the end. So the end of July, apart from the modern hunt and stuff, there'll be no more uh, of the other bits other, and pieces, bits the Hornadies and, and Coldwells and Smith Optics yeah. so and this Surefire. Is the, this is it. But well, there is a handful of caps. Yeah, there is. And what we'll do probably at the end is just to get rid of everything we have left is we'll do a big just bundle. A, do a big On the, bundle, la the yeah. last podcast of July, we'll do a big bundle. But right now, we're going to give you the chance to win a Hornady reloading uh, it's not a reloading really hat, really it's just a hat. hornady hat. If the hat could reload, then <laughs> it would be... Uh, it's like the sorting hat from Harry Potter. <laughs> it's, uh, in fact, I think we can throw in two because we've got plenty. Yeah, so it'll be two. a pair of hornady ammunition If you've got three mates, hats. we can give you three. We can give you three. <laughs> and uh, all we'd like you to do is just uh, su subscribe to our mailing list, please. Yep. So go onto our website, thepacebrothers.com, which incidentally is one of the places you can order Modern Huntsman, as well as the Modern Huntsman website, and just subscribe to our mailing if list. If you're already subscribed, you don't need to resubscribe no. because uh, uh, many of you have subscribed from previous competitions. Previous competitions that. So you, congratulations, you're You're entered. already entered. Um, and we promised not to send you any more than one a month. I think we send like three a year, but we'll, we'll probably... <laughs> we I'm going to try and get a bit better at that because we do... There are some interesting things I'm sure you'd like to know, So, but no more than one a month. Yeah. So weather's, that, weather's getting warm. That's the admin out of the way, I think. Admin's out of the way. Yeah. I hope that the weather stays the way it's going to stay. Well, I'm about to fly out to Africa, so I think it's going to be plenty, so plenty warm. It's going to be fine for you. Uh, so, have well, you got anything else to add before we jump into our intro with Tyler? Uh, I'm just trying to think what we've been up to. Pe people haven't really known what we've been up to the last. Well, we've been pretty manic. <laughs> uh, it's been a crazy. Uh, I I had four days doing a tour of Scotland with uh, our Norwegian friends. That was I actually can't believe that was only two weeks ago. Yeah, uh, I, I think they saw more of Scotland than most people that live here saw. Uh, with Glencoe, Edinburgh, Glasgow, then up towards Aberdeen. A bit of the west coast it was it was good saw that and then uh uh my bees they have not been uh they've that, been struggling a bit when i saw daryl yesterday he was almost in tears yeah they've been struggling a bit i've uh i've actually lost I've lost two colonies uh but these were um colonies that have been split and i actually think due to starvation uh it i'm still in the learning process and uh, i think just because we've had such bad weather uh, I just hadn't fed them enough, uh, even though there was plenty of food, like within a hundred meters of where they were. So, uh, but it's okay. We'll get back on the horse, and uh, I've still got a few colonies that are very, very strong. So we're all all good. So the next few shows are going to be split intros, I think. Uh, hopefully, um, we're t hopefully going to be doing a bit like I've done with Tyler, but short, like less than fifteen minutes. 
uh, we're going to be having intros with various people who have con con contributed to Volume 3 in Modern Huntsman, telling you a little bit about what they're writing about. Uh, so Lindsay Elliott, um, well, I did record this already, but unfortunately the recording didn't work very well. What an interesting lady. Uh, we definitely have to do a whole podcast with her uh, when we're back out in the States. Um, but she talks about um, her uh, con uh, contribution to Volume 3, but you'll hear that in two weeks' time, hopefully, if I can re-record with her today. <laughs> And uh, we actually, for want, are probably the most ahead we've ever been on podcast. Six and in the I, bank. And we'd like to stay that way. So we're going to just carry on recording. Yeah. And so, on so you're going to get one or two. So I got one this morning. I had a, a meeting with our friend um, Johnny Stage, who we were in Svalbard with uh, almost a year ago. It was a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, and I had a meeting with him this morning to do with um, stuff in other parts of the world uh, and we sat down in his Land Rover after our meeting and recorded a podcast because he's never been on the show despite the fact we've seen him plenty <laughs> and he's a really he's done some really interesting things and his company Sandgrass Travel um, goes to some intriguing places and they've been in the papers quite yeah. a few times over the last six months seven months mm. uh, basically because it's a it's a luxury travel yeah bespoke travel. bespoke travel mm. And yeah, they've been in the, from Africa to in the UK up. newspapers. Yeah. So yeah, I just uh, did an hour podcast with him this morning in his landy. And on Friday morning, when I the day after I land in South Africa, I'm going to be doing a podcast. I've just arranged it now with Dr. Ray Janssen. That's another two right there. Who is the director of the African Pangolin Working Group, who I mentioned on the podcast I did with Francois when I was in South Africa last time. So, yeah, those along with the whole bunch that we've already got in the bank, and I'll be getting some more when I'm out. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, we've got some great ones coming up. And then we'll arrange to do some more UK-based ones. 100%, uh, yeah. Because we've got a few US ones. A few US so, ones, yeah, so a few African we're, we're ones. We're getting quite di yeah. diverse with who we're getting on and the spectrum around the globe. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool. But I think we'll leave it there. Oh, no. Yes, Daryl has pointed out that one of the most important things to do, and then we'll jump in with our intro with Tyler, uh, which is that uh, two weeks ago we launched our Patreon, yes. which is a way for our listeners to support the show, and the uptake has been fantastic. So thank you to every single person who has supported us on Patreon. We've um, been gobsmacked, by the way, Yeah, with, with the amount of people that have started supporting us because this came from people asking how can they support us and that's why we did it and it's been pretty it's been great amazing so if you want to find out about that just visit the website thepacebrothers.com and click podcast and on there there's a patreon link and then you just click that it'll take you to the patreon page or if you actually google patreon into the wilderness or pace brothers it'll also take you there there's, uh, there's different tiers and stuff but regardless what tier you're on you're all amazing yeah uh, but there's a top two tiers uh, one of the things is you get a shout out on the podcast yeah. so i have a list of names uh which we're going to say thank you to which includes richard stevens richard mcneil uh, ronnie speakman from rdcontracting.co.uk which is um countryside services chris griffith uh john henry pete Tom McCraith and the guys at South Ayrshire Stalking, who are our latest top tier contributor. So yes. thank you to all oh, of you. And we've known those guys for a long time. A long time. So yeah, thanks guys. And I think that is it. Now we're going to jump in to the intro with Tyler Sharp, editor in chief of Modern Huntsman. And then in 20 minutes from there, you will be hearing from Levison Wood. Tyler. You're back on the Into the Wilderness podcast, all but briefly, because this isn't going to be a whole show with you, but for a number of very, very good reasons. One, because it's good to catch up with you. Absolutely. Uh, but secondly, secondly, uh, Modern Huntsman, as we announced on our last podcast, has become a partner of the show. So thank you very much. It's awesome to have you guys on board. Best news I've had in a while. I know we had, <laughs> we had kicked around the idea and you and I basically have been working on so much of this together anyways, that it just made sense. And I kind of threw it out to my team, not knowing how much they understood about podcasts and this and that, but, uh, everybody, you know, was kind of in disbelief. Wait, that's a, that's a not, that's a possibility. Yeah. Let's we got to do that. So yeah, yeah. We're, we're definitely excited to be working with you guys on a larger level now. Well, it's great. I mean, I, I couldn't think of a, I think we said this um, two weeks ago when the podcast went out, I can't think of a better synergy, uh, you know, from when we first spoke to you, which is, was that 18 months ago, two years ago, almost? <sighs> it, I don't know, man. Yeah, it, it uh, probably- it was a, it, it, <laughs> it was a little while ago, but probably not as long ago as it actually feels. And that's- <laughs> Probably that's close to two years. Just that we've yeah. done so much. Yeah. Probably close to two years. It was, yeah. 
So yeah, we you know we we said this before on the show when we've had you on, but we you know we bought into the the ethos of and your kind of mindset because it was the same kind of thing that we were you know talking about and making films about and podcasting about. So yeah, it's a, it's a great partnership, and I'm I'm looking forward to you know what the next months and years have in store for us. Absolutely, me too. A lot to do now. There is, and importantly. The other reason that you're on is because, as we've mentioned in the last few shows, Volume 3, Modern Huntsman, is about to drop. Very soon it's going to be in people's hands. I, Tell me about that. How excited I, are you? I am literally holding the first copy of Volume 3 in you're my hands not. right now. Yes, I am. Uh, oh I got my. a shipment uh, of 10 issues on Wednesday. And wait, no, today's Wednesday. So yesterday. And Tuesday, yeah you know, opening the box up and just closing your eyes and smelling the paper is, uh, quite an experience, but it is, uh, it's, it's crazy to hold something in your hands and think that this was the last five months of my life. And, and, uh, but no, it, it looks amazing. Uh, you know, the cover image we chose of Nick Joyce from, uh, from Australia is, is stunning. And, you know, we've been looking at this, for how, you know, months and most of it has been a digital file. And for now to see it in print perfectly bound with all the photography and high res and all the typography, it looks, it just looks beautiful. So oh, I am so excited to have it in my hands. Obviously I know, I know what it looks like. I know what the content is because I had a part in, uh, in helping you edit some of it, but there is a big difference between seeing that digital file and having something that's tangible. Yeah. And it's, I don't, I don't know if we mentioned this before, but so it's slightly larger than the last one. Volume two was 256 pages. This is 272. And it's, no, wow. it's, it's pretty amazing to lay one volume one, two, and three next to each other and see the slight increment in page count in each one, which is not a trend that is hopefully continues because we can't, we can't just keep making them bigger. Um, no. But it's... I can honestly say, and I think you would probably agree with me having seen one and two, that this is, this is the best work that we've done yet. There is some incredible stories and some mind blowing imagery in there. Give people a little taste of what, you know, what's in store for them. Sure. So where to start? Um, I mean, one, for instance, <laughs> well, you know, what, tell people what it's about. Because sure, you've, sure, sure. One thing with, with, with your volumes is they've been focused you know, on a, a broad topic, each one so far. Yeah. So volume two was public land, which isn't as relevant in the UK and Europe. And, and we discussed some of that. This one is themed around wildlife management, which is much more relevant all over the world. And, and whether that's related to, you know, ecosystem balance or population control or problem animals uh, or, and just, you know, general equilibrium, we, we kind of have a pretty wide range of topics there. Uh, all over. I mean, ranging from, uh, you know, the, the salmon farming issue. And, and, and while okay. Charles posts stories mostly focused, focused on the United States, uh, it's obviously very relevant in Scotland as well. Um, you know, and, and that's something that we actually got permission from Patagonia to, you know, publish some of their work and, and some of their film surrounding that subject, which to my understanding or my knowledge is the first time I've seen Patagonia in a hunting public publication. And I've never seen it elsewhere. Yeah, I haven't either. No, you know, uh, you know, there, there's we go into a hog population, uh, a hog overpopulation problem in Northern California. Um, you know, Ben Masters has a piece about the river and the wall. So the Rio Grande River that runs between Texas and Mexico. You know, obviously, I'm sure people have heard of this proposed border wall, and he kind of does a deep dive into, you know, the the implications that building that wall would have on wildlife migrations and ownership and land access which is a very, yeah, it's not just people. No, it's, it's, it's a very, you know, contentious topic. And Ben traveled the entire length of that border on a combination of canoes, horses, and bicycles, kind of documenting perspectives on both sides and, and, and digging into the ecological impacts, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then there's something even as basic as what, well, you know, cottontail rabbit management, of a couple of a couple of our uh, friends here in Montana have a garden that they have to keep rabbits out of in the winter so that they don't, when the snow melts, they don't find all their trees eaten and dying. Mm. Um, you know, there's uh, as we mentioned, Nick Joyce in Australia with 
um, you know, this management of water buffalo populations in in collaboration. The, the pictures on that are fantastic. They really are. They're yeah, mind blowing. They really are. And he's you know one of the few outsiders who's developed a relationship with these Aboriginal communities in what's called the Arnhem Lands, which are the Northwest, Northwest Territories of Australia. And uh, a really amazing story how he's developed this friendship and partnership with them. And they kind of allow him to come down and be an outfitter and an operator. Um, you know, we, we've got Max Lowe, who I know has been on your podcast. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And his story, he's got multiple contributions. One about his experience with polar bears up in, in Christchurch. I'm not, not Christchurch. Um, what's the name of that place in Canada? Um uh, I'm not quite sure where he was. I now. can't. I can't uh, remember. Way, way up. It north. starts with a C. I can't remember. Yeah. But, uh, anyways, there's a story about that and basically how the lack of polar ice forming is causing these bears uh, out of starvation to come into villages and cities, and it's causing a lot of human wildlife conflict and how they're dealing with that mm-hmm. and some of the local tribes, uh, what their reactions have been and things like that. So, you know, that's that's a very charismatic species that typically has a lot of people. Uh, you know, attached to that animal in the same way as a grizzly bear or, you know, an Arctic fox or an elephant. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting to be able to dive into those topics in a way that has a hopefully a constructive conversation about the reality of the situation. And, you know, yeah. I think that kind of that theme kind of runs throughout a lot of these stories. Um, and, and, you know, we have something about the grizzly delisting. I, uh, I know you've had Jack. Oh yeah. And cause J- that's with Jack and Jack's been on, uh, the podcast along with Logan yes, uh, from the bear, from trust, bear trust, but he will be on again, uh, for people who are interested, um, talking more about himself and how he got to where he was, um, you know, in a few weeks time, you, you'll be hearing from a whole podcast with Jack as well. Yeah. And I was at, so part of the reason we overnighted the first issues was they had a bear trust um, it was their annual board meeting. And so I was there the other night huh. meeting some of their board, kind of showing them the issue, talking about what we're trying to do and, uh, and seeing where we can align, you know, promotional efforts, or, you know, maybe that's a symposium or an additional podcast, just because it's information. And, and this is kind of part of why we started Mount Huntsman in the first place is that we just feel like this type of angle and perspective and content isn't really in my mainstream media very often. And there yeah. aren't that many people doing it. And the people who are doing it certainly aren't getting the airtime and the clicks and the, you know, dissemination that we feel it deserves. Uh, so we're trying to kind of circle the wagons and make sure that, you know, the people who we feel are supportive of what we're doing, understand, you know, what we're up against and, and what we're trying to accomplish and, and so that they can help in any way possible. So Mm. Um, and, and you, and you've also got, um, you've also got a great piece with Donnie Vincent. In this. We do. Yes. So has he been on before? He's been on, but probably like two and a half okay. years ago since we, I've spoken to Donnie since, cause he, he sent some stuff for our Pangolin auction. Mm-hmm. Uh, he kindly sent some signed DVDs, but we haven't had him on the podcast again. And I'm hoping that we will again at some point soon, but face to face, the last one was like a phone interview. Right. Well, yeah, we'll have to get, we'll have to get that going. I know he's interested in and continuing the conversation around the interview we had with him about his personal philosophy of, of being a hunter and a conservationist and a, and a biologist and, uh, you know, trying to find ways very similar to what you and I talk about day to day on finding ways to improve the communication and the understanding of how all of this works. Uh, Mm -hmm. we were very fortunate to have Chris Burkhard join the issue again, who was the cover photo of volume two. Tremendous. And they, him and a writer named Matt McDonald are working on a book about Iceland and how that massive eruption, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of that volcanic eruption a few years ago, but basically how that shifted the industry of, they were trying to, you know, use the glacial river melt to, um, you know, to not fuel, but they were using, harnessing that power to, 
produce aluminum, or as you would say, aluminum. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) uh, there's no I-U-M in that, by the way. So I don't know how you say. I I know. "Mm." Do you know what? (laughs) I actually had this same debate and discussion with an American friend of mine yes, just yesterday. And and I came to the conclusion that I think on on this on this occasion, yes. uh, unlike with Zs and Ss, uh, we are probably wrong. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> it's a matter of choice, I guess. But but anyway, so it, it's really interesting to read about how that eruption, the volcanic eruption, which I can't remember the exact statistic, but it disrupted I think almost fifty percent of international air travel during that eruption. Mm. And um, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole story, but long story short. They, you know, Iceland's number one um, import now, or not import, but, you know, source of funds is tourism. And so there was kind of this realization, you know, maybe we shouldn't be industrializing these glacial rivers when, when there's millions and millions of people who want to come see these. So there is a proposal on the table to create a a national park in Iceland that would cover 40% of the island. And that's something that Chris and Matt are working on drawing attention to and collaborating with the Icelandic government. And so that's not as specifically relevant to wildlife management. It goes into a little bit about the habitat and and the effect that that would have. Um, But but it just, you know, it's kind of an illustration of of the power of, you know, online influence and social media uh, with somebody like Chris. Um, you know, you guys, you and Daryl have two amazing pieces in here. One, one, your uh, doctoral dissertation on grouse management between the UK <laughs> and the US. Uh, and then you guys. I didn't think I was ever going to finish uh, that. Well, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> so I'm excited for people to read it. You're too kind. And uh, yeah. And then you guys got to got to create a little biopic on on Holland and Holland and, and their history of gun making and, and what how they're kind of investing in the future. Uh, yeah, it's that was exciting to have the opportunity to go down there. And I actually just got an email from them, uh, I think yesterday, mm-hmm. that the uh, we mentioned it at the end of that article that they were they basically opened a bursary scheme mm-hmm. um, for young people in the countryside uh, to essentially like further their education. And the shortlisting for that has now been done. And there is uh, a big event down in London um, quite soon where all the people who have been shortlisted are going to be there. Um, so that's really exciting and fantastic to see them like investing with actual cash Mm -hmm. in the future in in young people. So to translate, as I feel like it is my job for the U.S. listeners, a bursary (laughs) scheme is basically a grant program. So they are giving money to young conservationists, naturalists, biologists, and it's kind of an application process, correct? Where you you sort of apply for this money and then they basically fund this program. So, um, and I, and I will point this out because I think that people might overlook it if they don't know, but the first image on Byron and Daryl's Holland and Holland story is actually the original order form for Theodore Roosevelt's custom Holland and Holland rifle that was built in 1908, which is and uh, I was so amazing. excited to, <laughs> to get my hands on that. It was in the, uh, like this incredible like 500 page book on, on, on the history of Holland and Holland. And I spoke to them uh, in putting the piece together from Alden Huntsman, having been around the factory and met everybody there. And they said, yeah, we, we can get you that image. And I said, if you can get that image, that would be yeah. incredible uh, because it's just such a beautiful tie in, you know, that there is something which is, you know, we're talking about the manufacture of guns, but the heritage uh, behind what they've done in the past, what they are now doing in the future, and also the people who have used them. Yeah. Like Theodore Roosevelt is the, the granddaddy of uh, North American conservation. It's just a fantastic tie in. Yeah. And we also got, you know, Boone and Crockett, apart from Bear Trust, was, was one of our conservation partners, and they gave us access to their archive of photos. And we got some incredible old historic black and white photos of TR in the, you know, when Yellowstone was being founded. And, and you know, this sort of, national park conservation program was created and it was, it was a uh, pretty, pretty amazing to get to work with, with images like that and provide some historical context. And uh, yeah. And then I, uh, you know, my, my main effort in this issue was actually about your homeland. So hmm. I got to do, you know, when I was over there in November, you, you took me up to the Invermark estate and I got to do not as deep as I would like, but a fairly deep dive into you know, the history of gamekeepers and and stag management and and the balance of the ecosystem and and sort of the threats and challenges that that way of life faces. 
And uh, yeah, I, I got some amazing photos. Even though you guys said the weather was really bad, that's what I expected was the fog and the rain yeah. and the moodiness. It kind of made did. it. It did. In terms of the story and the imagery, it, it, it kind of made some it very, really shitty weather. <laughs> that uh, I'm really, really proud of. And, you know, it's just one of those things where having a, a mother who's from a very small town in Texas, I've always tried to have an approach to storytelling that she could understand, right? Not that it requires dumbing something down, but you know, that famous saying, what good is, is wisdom if the common person can't understand it. And so to be able to go over there and learn about that way of life that a lot of people here in the United States don't know about and being able to translate that in a way that people understand, but at the same time, knowing that, well, hoping that people in the UK might read this uh, and, and that mm-hmm. some common sense could be gained from it, or they might see it from a different light, being an outsider presenting the story that what they're doing on these estates is very important work. And unless there's a very, you know, well thought out alternative solution to, you know, improve these habitats and, and manage these populations and do this incredible conservation work, then there isn't really any reason nor uh, any justification for removing that system. In my opinion, yeah, I think from from my point of view, it's so I I talked a little bit about uh, deer management in volume mm-hmm. two in the article I put in, and what's lovely about this is, as you said, you're approaching it as someone who is not from here, and you're learning a lot of it as you go, which means that you're gonna have a different uh, thought process when you're trying to explain it. And I, I think that's, it's a really nice to take that angle, just the same as I learned a lot of stuff when I was with you in the States. And I, I'm putting it together with my base knowledge of the UK and Europe. And I think you can end up in some slightly different places and conclusions, which is really useful for, for us to kind of go through that exercise so we can better understand what we do in a global context. Absolutely. And I, I was having this conversation with one of the sons on the ranch I live on, you know, cause he lives in this amazing part of the world in Montana, but this is where he is most of the time. And unless you are able to travel or unless you are able to read perspectives similar to some of these in the book about how it actually works in other places, your opinion of those places is formed through just, you know, what you hear online or, or what you see on the news. And that often isn't the truth or the reality of the situation. And so you know, that's very, very important to me that we are presenting perspectives from other parts of the world because, you know, and this is something that you wrote about in your international editor's letter. I don't know if you announced to everyone that you are the official internet. I don't know if I've actually announced so, it on the yeah, podcast Byron yet. Pace, no. <laughs> international editor for Modern Huntsman. So it was something I wish I could have offered a long time ago, but, you know, now that we've started to grow our team and, you know, you just have such a such a wonderful grasp of the international issues. And while I'm trying to learn as much as I can about them, you know, that's something that I want to make sure that you are overseeing and any, any story that we're putting forth about international hunting or conservation, making sure that that's our best foot forward and that we're, you know, positively contributing to the efforts to, you know, move that forward or protect it or preserve it, whatever you want to say. And so, um, Mm. yeah, so glad to have you. (laughs) <laughs> no, it's a pleasure uh, to be, it's a pleasure, pleasure to be a bigger part of the but, team. But as I was, as uh, and I, I was going to say, sorry, as on, you wrote in your letter, and I wrote about this too, is that nowadays in this world, it's no longer just domestic issues. This is an international, mm-hmm. it is a global conservation. I don't want to say crisis, right? But it can't just be, okay, what problems is Montana facing or what problems is Scotland facing, right? No. Because these are interconnected and whether we like it or not, um, you know, with the, with the crazy population that's expanding in the world and the use of social media, that the, you know, dissemination of information and content happens in seconds all over the world. And so I think that that uh, is something that we are trying to be aware of and trying to address in, in as many ways as we can, um, because ultimately, if we can, you know, affect or positively educate, you know, a larger part of the international population who doesn't hunt, that's only going to make things better for what we need to accomplish. Knowledge is power and better decisions can be made with better knowledge. 
That should be a T-shirt. Now, I'm conscious of the fact <laughs> <laughs> that should be a T-shirt or, or a yes. bumper sticker. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact we've been talking for 20 minutes and I said that this wasn't going to be an entire yep. podcast. So I'm just going to wrap up where you're going to yep. be on again uh, soon. And we have uh, various people who have, been, who have contributed to Volume 3 going to be giving us little short intros about their articles in the coming months uh, and on podcasts. I'm really looking forward to connecting with those people. Um, but just to wrap up, how can people find out more about Modern Huntsman and where can they buy sure. a copy? Well, it depends on what country you're in. So I, one of the best places for information is our Instagram, right? It's just at Modern Huntsman. It's Modern Huntsman on Facebook and it's modernhuntsman.com on the website. Depending on which country you're in, if you're in the U.S., you know, I believe it still says pre-order, but all of the all of the magazines have been printed, 15,000. They are on, they are currently being shipped to our fulfillment center. So any day now, those orders will start to be fulfilled and it will go from pre-order to purchase. Uh, if you're in the UK or you're in Europe, we are also happy to announce that, you know, the Pace brothers, Byron and, pa- and Byron and Daryl are helping us with European distribution. So we actually have a fulfillment center in London now. So international yep. shipping is going to decrease by 60%. So, you know, it's very, ba- you know, normal shipping rates for Europe rather than, you know, the, the $25 or $30 dollars you are having to charge for international shipping. So it's going to be a lot easier for people overseas to get the book. And I believe that's through your site, isn't, is it? Yeah. So, I mean, you can just go uh, to make life simple. You just go to the Modern Huntsman yes. website, because if you're an international, um, if you're someone who's ordering internationally, it basically forces you to link okay. through to our site. But you can you can go to both. You can go to both. But if you're in North America, yeah. go straight there. If in doubt, go to the Modern Hunts- Huntsman website and it'll it'll direct you correctly, depending on where you're, uh, what part of the yeah, world Yeah. And, and we're going to be releasing a lot more content on the website with all of the contributors from this issue. Uh, little backstories, interviews, you know, obviously with some of the podcasts we're going to be doing, we'll dive a little deeper into some of those topics. But uh, but yeah, I would say, you know, social media or, or, or modernhuntsman.com is, is probably the best place. Tyler, it's a pleasure to speak to you as always. You're going to be back on again soon. Thank you once again for supporting the podcast as yourself uh, and as uh, Modern Huntsman, which is the ship that you are steering. And uh, hopefully we will see each other face to ga- face, to face Absolutely. again soon. in Montana for the fall hunting. Yep. yep. Cheers. Thanks, buddy. Levison, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Thank you for joining us today. We are recording this in Discovery Channel HQ. Thank you very much for having me. I don't think that there is a more appropriate person to have on a podcast called Into the Wilderness than probably yourself, (laughs) (laughs) given the places that you've traveled over the years. Uh, We're going to get to uh, a new a program that you've got coming out, um, Arabia with Levison Wood, yourself, uh, which is in, in a couple of weeks or it'll be a couple of days after this podcast goes out. But to give a little bit of backstory and background for people who maybe don't know what you've done prior to that, where did this kind of lust for adventure start? Because it's it's an adventure at the extreme. I'm thinking sort of pre your military career. What was it as part of growing up that led you to where you are now? Is there sort of a moment that you can think, yeah, that's what gave me the bug to do this? I think it was a combination of factors. I think that I grew up um, as the son of two teachers and we lived on the edge of the Peak District. So I grew up in, a, in the countryside, you know, and it was it was great. And, and you know, they both encouraged me to spend time outdoors. And that I think was uh, a very formative experience. You know, childhood um, spent playing outside, which seems a bit strange these days, doesn't it? Um, sadly. That's what childhood should be. Exactly. Um, and I think that um, combined with a passion for and, and real interest in, in history, actually, because that's what inspired me to read about the explorers of times gone by and you know, these, these amazing eccentrics that just disappeared around the globe on boats and whatever for, 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 you know, donkey's years. And, you know, that really stuck with me and not, not, um, not to mention my, uh, grandfather as well. He was, you know, uh, in, in the second world war and he was 
a young man from Stoke on Trent who'd literally never left the his, his part of the city, you know, in inner city in Stoke, and uh, he was suddenly sent off to to go and fight in the jungles of Burma. So imagine, you know, that must have been an incredible adventure. So when he was telling me these stories when I was a kid, um, I think it left a lasting impression. And um, from, you know, my school days, I was desperate to go and explore the world for myself and kind of came up with a plan fairly early on. I think I must have been in my early teens when I decided that, you know, a good way to explore the world was was possibly a career in the army. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that to get there, there were certain steps I had to do. And as I grew up and learned a bit more about the sort of process involved. I was encouraged to take a gap year, like a lot of you know kids do when they're sort of eighteen, out of, out of high school. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I did at the age of eighteen. You know, I'd been on a few family holidays, and I'd, I'd sort of done a trip to Ibiza with my mates. But um, actually, you know, going off on my own, a one-way ticket to South Africa, and then spending the next six months backpacking around the world was was incredibly cliched, but also you know an amazing experience. Um, and inspired me to, to to really never stop doing that. So how did you how did you wrench yourself out of that and go into the military after <laughs> experienced that sort of six months of freedom? Well, I, I so that was before university. I, I knew I wanted to go to university and, and study history, and that's what I did. So I went to Nottingham, and uh, and actually I I kind of went with an idea of, of the sort of subjects that I wanted to study, and I was very interested in military and political history. Um, so I did did a lot of that, but when I, when it came to choosing my dissertation, um, I had a, a professor at university. Uh, I'll never forget Dr. Ross Balzaretti, whose specialist subject was the Grand Tour. So he specialised in 18th century travellers who basically, you know, went off travelling around looking at pieces of art in Italy and uh, you know places like that. And I ended up. Did, actually choosing to study social history, which wasn't really my background, but reading these diaries of 18, 19 year olds from 400, 300 years ago was quite inspiring because it turns out things haven't changed all that much actually, you know, and, and these guys were, were basically going there on the pretense of learning all about works of art and paintings and so on. But actually they got up to, you know, far more sordid stuff on the side. And uh, it definitely was a jolly. It was well. a total <laughs> jolly, of course. <laughs> um, and, but I thought, but I, you know, I started learning all about the sort of great overland journeys, uh, the Silk Road, uh, Marco Polo's journeys, uh, the great sort of pilgrimages. And, and I thought, you know, I've studied this, I, you know, for the last three years, why not? before going to join the army. So I, I deferred my entrance to the army by 12 months to go and do another gap. Yeah. So that's, uh, but I thought rather than doing what I'd done before, which is just a pretty standard backpacking trip, I thought, why not do a big overland hitchhike? Um, now my parents' generation, they were, they were the sort of hippies, uh, you know, in the sixties and seventies, my parents certainly weren't, but I, I was quite inspired by, by the stories of that era. So I, I basically put my thumb up at Grantham services on the A1 and hitchhiked to India. No way. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was brilliant, you know, at so the age of, how old were I was you 20, 22 at this stage. Yeah. It was, uh, it was quite an adventure though. I basically, you know, got down to Calais, uh, skipped over the channel and then, carried on and went all the way through Europe, through Russia, through... It's not exactly next door. No, no. It, did it, you go, it, go all the way down India? I went all the way down to Goa. That's where I finished five months later. Do you know how much the whole trip cost? Yeah, probably almost nothing. It was, yeah, 500 quid. You know, I spent, I basically barely paid for any accommodation. Uh, certainly outside of Europe, it was just people to invite you into their homes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, there were times, I mean, in Iran, I had literally no money, none whatsoever. Afghanistan, I had no money um, because I'd, I'd used up all my cash. And I think I had like $100 of traveler's checks, which you, you can't change in Afghanistan, funnily enough. So I was literally having to like beg off the locals. But it wasn't difficult because the locals were so incredibly friendly. Um, so I did, yeah, I went over the Khyber Pass and the Hindu Kush mountains and, um, ended up in the Himalayas and, uh, and then spent uh, another month backpacking around India. So it was great fun. And, and again, an, another really formative trip, um, that meant that when I did finally make it into the army at the age of 23, you know, I'd already been to Afghanistan, which kind of annoyed a lot of my superior officers because they, you know, they were, at that point there wouldn't have been many people who had already no, been there. Exactly, not yeah. off their own backs. No, certainly. Absolutely, certainly not. So, um. I felt, you know, quite well prepared actually at that stage to then join the army. Very different, obviously, you know, I t came back from India with sort of long hair and a big beard and looking pretty scruffy um, to then had to 
change my mindset entirely to go and join the army. But I, it was kind of all part of a, a kind of dream and a plan actually to sort of get to where I wanted to be. And it all, it all pieced together quite nicely. And what, uh, how long was your, your military career and what was your, your actual role during that time? So I commissioned from Sandhurst in the summer of 2006 um, into the parachute regiment. And I wanted to join the paras because I was, you know, the paras has got a reputation for being one of the toughest regiments to get into. Um, and I like a challenge. And uh, and so, yeah, I, I joined the paras. Um, all the training that goes with that, passing what's called P Company, which is the, the selection to get in, was, was incredibly tough um, physically, emotionally. Uh, then the parachuting itself, and then all of the build-up training before serving in Afghanistan. So in, in the summer of uh, 2008, I went to Afghanistan um, for the second time, um, but this time obviously in a very different capacity. So we were right on the front line fighting against the Taliban. Um, and and yeah, that, that was another very um, surreal and unique experience, I suppose. How long had the for our forces been in Afghanistan at that point by the time you got there? Well, it really, I mean, our forces had been there in various capacities since the fall of the Taliban in, in 2002, but it didn't really kick off properly until 2006. So they'd been fighting there for two years before I was there. Um, so when I was there, it was, you know, really sort of ramping up to to the sort of the heyday of it all, I suppose. And there were literally fighting seasons. There were, you know, every summer the Taliban would come out to fight and then they'd go back to home, their villages and homes to, to tend their crops afterwards. So it was, uh, yeah, it was strange days. But um, but again, you know, you learn a lot. Um, we were involved not just in the fighting, but but also we, we were there to try and help the local population. Um, we were building schools and rebuilding police stations. So it was, it was a real mix, you know, and it's, uh, it's a very, um, it's almost, you know, we talk about modern warfare, we think about drones and missiles and computers and all this sort of stuff. But, you know, Afghanistan, the fighting, you know, on the boots on the ground probably wasn't all that different to the first, second and third Afghan wars over the last 150 years, you know. Um, and actually there was one stage where we were camped out inside this ancient fortress that the British army in 1880 uh, had actually stayed in. Same fortress. That's incredible. You know, and it was just a real humbling um, sense of, of history. And, and that was that was kind of my passion. So it's very weird to be Drawing there. back to what you'd studied. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It must have given you, you must have had an amazing insight having been there previously. Did it have a, a different feel? I know that you you were at the sharp end of the stick when uh, you were there with the army, but it must have had a different feel when you were hitchhiking through through it. Well, it did because I, when I was hitchhiking there in, in 2004, you know, I... I was dressed as a local, I had a big beard and I could blend in pretty well as, a, as an Afghan, you know, and, and, and I did. I was walking across most of the country or, or jumping on the back of a donkey or whatever it was. And the locals obviously didn't know what to make of me. Um, the good thing about Afghanistan, if you want to blend in, is that there's lots of different tribal and ethnic groups. So, you know, it, they don't automatically assume, you, assume you're a Western or an Englishman. They just, they think that you're just from a different tribe. So the fact that you don't necessarily speak the language isn't, doesn't necessarily give you away. So I was able to, to sort of get most of the way across Afghanistan. Um, fairly straightforward. I was actually taken in by a family of opium smugglers um, for, for, a, for almost a week when I got stranded in, in the central mountains. And, uh, and that was a real, you know, that was an eye opener to say the least, because these guys were, you know, they were part of the Mujahideen. They were probably fighting against British and American soldiers later on in the war. So, yeah, I, you know, it, it was it was a strange a strange experience. But to go back and then obviously be in uniform, armed, totally different experience. But I wouldn't say one was necessarily more dangerous or more safe than the other because obviously if you're if you're there as a soldier, you know, you, you get shot at. Um, but you've also got the backup because you're with your unit. You're with you know you've got helicopter support. If you get injured, then you hope that somebody is coming to get you. If you're there on your own in the middle of Afghanistan, then you've Nothing. got no support. Nobody even knows where you are. And in those days, bear in mind, there was, this was before smartphones, wasn't carrying a GPS or anything like that. So You literally were by yourself. I was on my own, yeah. What? Well, my mother had no idea where I was, yes. <laughs> did you even send a postcard every so often? I did. I sent one when I, when I actually made it clear of, of, uh, of Afghanistan. I think when I, when I finally got to India, I sent her a postcard saying, arrived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine there was maybe a few sleepless nights mm. at home. 
Yeah, more than likely. <laughs> so from from that point, how much longer were you uh, in the military before the, the you made the leap out? Uh, did you have a, a few years? What, what else yeah, were you involved there were in? Yeah, a few you years. I left. Um, so I, after Afghanistan, I then became an instructor um, at the infantry training centre. So I was training new recruits. Um, I had a team of you know for almost ninety soldiers to look after, um, and quite a lot of responsibility, and, and that was great. Um, but there was also a lot of, you know, desk bound stuff and that, you know, as you rise through the ranks, there's inevitably a, a bit more, more paperwork, paperwork like, yeah. and, and all the rest of it, which wasn't really why I joined the army. I, I joined the army for a more of a, you know, to, to have a, hopefully a positive impact and a bit of an adventure. And, uh, and so I decided that I needed a new challenge. So I left the army in 2010. Um, I actually managed to somehow break my leg, um, which kind of also, you know, automatically. Well, during, when you were in the military. When I was in, yeah, I was, I was actually, because um, I was thinking about, do I stay in, do I leave? And then I, I broke my leg, which kind of, for me, that was, that was a sign. That was a, the, the omen to leave. So I, I left uh, without much of a plan because, you know, I had a broken leg and, and uh, luckily I was able to sort of leave in a fairly short window. So I did and, uh, and I ended up volunteering uh, for a, a charity in Africa um, because I I thought well you know I've got got the opportunity to to try do a few different things here I was actually headhunted by a a, a major bank to go and work for them um, except I you know I went to um, went to Canary Wharf with my suit on and uh, decided pretty quickly that wasn't for me that's not the life I wanted <laughs> so I I lasted all of about. 45 minutes in Canary <laughs> Wharf before turning around. I think probably a wise decision given what you did afterwards. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I ended up literally the next day, I, a friend of mine was had uh, set up a clinic in Malawi and uh, she she said, look, we need some ambulances desperate at this clinic. Is there any way you can maybe help out, speak to your contacts? And uh, so I thought, well, rather than just, you know, raising cash, you know, on whatever, one of these just giving pages or whatever, rather than doing it that way and maybe sending them out in a shipping container, I thought, why not actually turn it into a bit of an adventure? So I ended up um, building a team, got got about 15 of my mates together, army guys, friends from university. We we raised uh, a good chunk of money between us, just literally, you know, rattling buckets. Bought two, um, two cars, two Land Cruisers off eBay, uh, painted them white, turned them into ambulances, got loads of donations from hospitals for, for various bits of kit. And then we drove 10,000 miles uh, through 27 countries, um, all the way through Europe, through the Middle East, through Syria, um, all the way down to Southern Africa and Malawi. And it was such fun. It was only two months, you know. It was, um, this was quite a quick trip, actually, for all the length, uh, for, all, for all yeah, the distance. Yeah, big distance. But, you know, the idea was to donate these two vehicles to this hospital. So you were just driving. Yeah, I mean, there, there were plenty of adventures on the way, that's for sure. But, it, you know, it was great. It was very re rewarding to be able to, uh, you know, give something back and have, um, you know, contribute to this this clinic. And uh, But also, it was I mean, great fun, you know, I was there with my mates and I, I, and I realized there and then actually that was how I wanted to, to sort of spend my time. Adventuring so, and exploring adventuring, and exploring, new people. Building teams, but it, it wasn't just the doing it for the sake of it because I, you know, that was that, there's nothing wrong with that. What I really got, um, a sense of reward w was actually having a positive impact and, and spending that time with people I liked. So I thought, why not, you know, use that same concept of, of going on an expedition with a sort of set aim and, and turning that into uh, somehow, somehow making it into a, a lifestyle. But obviously by that stage I was pretty skint because I'd say, you know, I'd used up all my army savings. Um, I'd actually, I wanted to try out being a photographer as well. So I bought a, bought a camera so there was uh, the rest of the money. And, uh, and, and yeah, that got literally got nicked two days later <laughs> on a bus. So that, that was a bit of a disaster as well. And it wasn't insured. So there's a moral in the story somewhere. Um, but, uh, so, so at this stage I thought I need to get it, either get a job or, or somehow, uh, you know, make this live, you know, this lifestyle work. So me and another friend from the army, we thought, well, using that, the template of the trip that I'd just done, this ambulance trip, why not, um, organize, guided expeditions for, you know, paying team members. We thought, well, where's our, where does our experience lie? Well, we've, you know, we, we, we op we've operated in war zones. We've got a lot of experience in that area. And, you know, we're good at organizing stuff. So we, we basically set up a sort of expedition company taking paying clients to conflict zones and war zones, which sounds a bit bonkers, but turns out, you know, 
demand went through the roof. You know, our first trip was horse riding across Afghanistan and it sold out literally straight away. So, so when was this? 2012? This was 2012, yeah. And um, maybe even 2011, 2011, yeah. It, it was great fun. You know, it was just a two-week trip, tra- horse riding across Afghanistan. And then we did another one uh, walking across Sudan. Then we did Madagascar. We went uh, mountain climbing in uh, northern Iraq. Um, so all the fun holiday spots, you know, and, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was great. But, you know, going to those places, what I did is, is use that as an opportunity to um, develop my, you know, by then I could finally afford to buy another camera. So I, I then, you know, uh, used those, those trips as a, as a means to build my own photography portfolio. I started writing for guidebooks, you know, Lonely Planet, Brad Guys, all these sort of magazines. Um, I Did you just it. approach them and just say, look, well, I said, look I'm, you know, nobody else is going to Northern Iraq or, yeah. or wherever, or Afghanistan, do you want some photos? And, and so I sold a few photos. I entered a few into competitions, won a few prizes. And, you know, by just doing it incrementally, slowly, slowly, um, you know, develop my own skills because I had no background. I'd, I'd not had any formal training in, in, in writing or filmmaking or photography, but so I taught myself all these, these, these so new skills. you created skills. this career yeah, out, absolutely. Of a, out of a love of what you wanted to do. Totally. Yeah. And, um, and bit by bit it came together and we started to get more experience in, uh, working with media, proper media, because it wasn't long before we got a reputation as an organization, small team, uh, of taking, uh, you know, journalists, because, you know, we were approached by lots of broadcasters saying, look, can you take our news crew into South Sudan or Afghanistan? And then, so we started taking journalists, but very much behind the camera, you know, we were organizing the security, the logistics, uh, generally looking after them to make sure they were safe so that they, they could do their job. So behind the scenes, I was then getting understanding of how the world of media worked and the understanding, you know, the language that, that, that people in media use and uh, you know, the, the filmmakers use and how to point a camera in the right direction. So all of those things, then I was picking up just over the, over the course of two or three years. Um, until one day a director was chatting to me, said, you know, have you ever thought of being in front of the camera? I said, well, not really, but I really want to write a book. That was my dream, you know, was to, was to actually write a, a book about adventure and travels and sort of following the footsteps of my own heroes and people that have inspired me, the, the great Victorian explorers and so on. And so when, when this guy, Neil, uh, he was a director, he, he, you know, he said, well, you know, if you, if you do your own expedition, we film it, you know, you can write a book about it. It will, it will take off. But of course, you know, I had no idea at that stage. I thought, well, you know, whatever, it, maybe, maybe not, but I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing. It's because you want to do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he said, well, have you got any ideas? And I said, well, there is one thing, you know, I'd, I'd done this drive through Africa with my mates a few years back, um, all the way down to Malawi with the ambulances. And for the most part, that journey had followed the course of the River Nile. So, and along that trip, I'd, I'd, I'd been thinking, wouldn't it be great to do this a bit slower? Because like I said before, we were kind of rushing to get to the, this hospital. Why not walk it? So this, this journey had been a bit of a pipe dream for, for four or five years until, until Neil mentioned this. And, and I happened to be in South Sudan when he was talking about it. So I thought, well, you know what, I, why not walk the Nile? And I went on Google and realized that nobody had ever done it before. And I thought, well, this is, this is the idea that, that I need to, to pitch. And so we did and, and it got picked up and the rest is history, so to speak, you know, because it, the feet haven't really touched the ground since then. It's a weird coincidence because probably about a week before we got an email to say, would you like to hook up an interview to talk about your, the, the new show? Uh, we had been listening to your book in the car. Oh, <laughs> walking really? the Nile, walking yeah. the Nile, okay. A week before, with completely unconnected. <laughs> and uh, what a story. I mean, yeah, an that was an journey. adventure. It really was. And, yeah. and what a character, well, the characters you met along the way as well. Mm, yeah. Well, they were what made it, you know, it's, and it always, for me, the journeys have always been about the people, you know, I never set out along the Nile. People always say, you know, did you get a Guinness world record? It was never really about that for me. It was about the, the adventure itself, you know, the, even the walking, you know, don't get me wrong, I love walking, but it was never about the physical activity. It was never about testing myself because I I kind of done that in the army and I didn't really have anything to prove it was about immersing myself in different cultures different environments and finding these amazing people finding these amazing stories and and sharing them with other people how did you uh I mean how did that develop because you must have you know the start it's kind of well I was very nervous you know pointing (laughs) pointing a camera pressing a button but as each day went but so the the whole when you're in front of the camera it's a very different kettle of fish isn't it and and actually 
I, it didn't feel particularly natural. You know, <laughs> it just doesn't. Um, and you, but you, what you have to do is really have faith in the people that you're working with. You've got to have faith in the, the director. You've got to have faith in the editors that they're not going to make you look like an idiot because you get a bit self-conscious, uh, you know, initially, but, um, Actually, when I saw the edit, when, when I realized that they, they'd cut out all the bits that, um, you know, where I was just, uh, you know, umming and erring, then you realize actually they're professionals that, you know, it's in everybody's interest to make this thing a success and can breathe a bit of a sigh of relief and actually think, you know, I'll just get on with this now. So. So did you have anyone else on that trip helping you film or not? So the crew, so to speak, which was generally never more than two or three people, um, would fly out for, you know, a few days or a week. Then they'd leave me to it for whatever, a month, two months, then come out. So obviously uh, the journey took me in the region of nine months. You can't afford to pay cameramen and directors for nine months, as you can imagine. So, um, so yeah, they kind of chose, I think they came out four times or five times over the space of that time, just to, just to make sure they got a few GVs and, and, you know, all the sort of the pretty shots and lots of sunsets and the stuff that I probably missed along the way. Um, you know, but the rep, the vast majority, you know, 70, 80% was, was, was me with a little handy cam because that's, you know, you've got to be fairly covert when you're going through roadblocks in yeah. Egypt and Sudan or wherever else. Um, you know, and just doing it myself with, with a local guide, you know. It's amazing how, and uh, what an incredible story can be stitched together, like visually mm. by yourself, you know, largely by yourself. But like, like well, you said, got, there's you a know, lot of, um, you know, a lot of that is to do with the editing team, course. but you still have to capture it in the first place. You do. I mean, we got a thousand hours of footage for that to turn into four hours of TV. So you can imagine. That's a know, lot I'd, to pick through. Yeah. I mean, I don't envy the editors. I mean, they, they do an amazing job. Um, but that's what makes television. I want to see what's in the bin. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot in the bin of re very good stuff as well. What I found amazing about this journey in particular and your other journeys that we're going to talk about in a, a minute is that it's typically human conflict that stops you dead in your tracks. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people would think it would be, you know, wildlife and terrain, but... No, that's the easy bit. No, yeah. it's, um, it's very much the bureaucracy usually um, and, and people being scared of letting you go through that checkpoint or whatever. It's, uh, that's always the tricky bit and, and getting the right visas, the right permits, the right access in the first place. That's always the, the hardest bit. We won't go into all of them because we, we don't have time to, today, but what uh, give people an idea of the the adventures that followed that leading up to the, the new series that you've got coming out. What, what was between the Nile and what we're about to talk about? So I got back from the Nile and there was a state of flux for a few months because whilst the editors were doing their thing, I had no idea whether or not this would end up, you know, on, on the TV at sort of 4am on a Tuesday and nobody would watch it. So when it actually came out and it... How it, long did that take, by the way? Uh, well, the edit. The whole process. Yeah, um, so. Well, they were editing as I was away because I was oh, away okay. for such a long time. But then I think it came out in the UK um, in January 2014. And basically that was when it all changed because it, you know, it was out on prime time. It got distributed around the world. Um, you know, it, it went out on discovery channel in lots of different countries and, um, it suddenly was a huge success. And, and before I knew it, you know, my life had gone from, you know, I was literally sleeping on mates floors for three years before that. So to then go from that to, um, to being, having all these different offers was, was, was just mind blowing. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I, I didn't just go for the first thing that came along next because I did get lots of offers to go and, you know, do very weird and wonderful things. <laughs> things um, that other, pe other people had come up with ideas yeah, for you. Yeah, but I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns here. I'm, I'm only going to do things that I want to do and that I feel really passionate about because I think that's, it's important to be authentic and and to, to carve your own niche out. And, and so basically I thought, well, you know, using this concept of, of traveling at the slowest pace, going by foot, meeting people, staying with locals, keeping it really raw and rough. Why not go to another area that I was passionate about? And the, that area was the Himalayas because Beautiful. I backpacked through there as a backpacker. I'd been to Nepal, India. You know, I'd studied the the history of the great game and the silk road so i'd got a you know i'd got an interest in this area i've been to afghanistan with the army so i thought why not walk the length of the himalayas and that's what i did so i walked from afghanistan all the way to the tibetan border in bhutan so that was another six months that went on tv i wrote another book about that um and then after that one i said well by then you know i was asked well okay what do you want to do next so I was preempting this by thinking, you know, racking my brain. Usually when I was walking, what's the next one? So I thought, well, somewhere that's a bit different, 
you know, is Central America. Because what I'd realised that these journeys really uncovered was not just the adventure, the history, the cultures, but also challenging people's preconceived ideas about a place. Because often in the media, we only get one side of the story. So I thought, well, Central America, from certainly from a British sort of European perspective, it's kind of full of narco traffickers and jungle. Maybe if you're interested in history, you might know a bit about the Aztecs and the ancient Mayan civilization. But, you know, what, what's to differentiate Honduras from Nicaragua or Costa Rica, you know? So I thought, well, why not take that concept, go and explore it and really show people what this region is about? So I walked from Mexico to Colombia, the whole length of Central America, picking out these stories along the way. And, and that was fascinating. You dived in a really cool cave. Yeah, there was there was amazing like the, 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 with the, called cenotes, which um, are basically where the ancient Mayans used to do their human sacrifices. So they're full of bodies and bones, you know, a thousand years old, and you can dive down there. And it's it's a very strange place. But I lo- what I loved about that region was it was so different culturally um, that that every day was a new surprise. So. So yeah, that, that went well. Uh, got back from that one. And then um, the next journey I did was actually bridging the gap between Europe. Because I'd wanted i done all of these fairly exotic areas. I thought, why not bring it a bit closer to home um, and look at the sort of the fringes of Europe. So I, I then did a journey from uh, the Black Sea in Russia along the Caucasus Mountains to the Caspian Sea in Iran. So I went through all of the um, South, the, the Caucasian uh, independent uh, Islamic states, so places like Chechnya, Dagestan, and then into the South Caucasus, Georgia, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. And it was fascinating. It was really interesting seeing how this, this very narrow region has been so important in, in world history. Um, so that, that, that I did as well. Um, and then... Basically, I I'd, I'd sort of realised that the one region that was still left for me to explore, that, that I'd studied anyway at least, um, was the Middle East. Because, you know, I'd, I'd walked the length of the Nile and, and finished in Egypt. Um, the Caucasus journey had taken in, you know, what was the old Persian Empire and uh, the Caucasian states. And in the middle was this big, blank map, uh, you know, blank in the map of, of desert. And I'd, I'd always been fascinated by the Middle East. I'd, I'd travelled there bits and pieces, whether it was with the army or just travelling alone. And and actually, in, in when I was a student uh, as well, I'd, I spent a uh, summer backpacking around Egypt, Israel, uh, Jordan, and bizarrely found myself in Iraq in 2003, which was when the Iraq war was happening. Uh, and I got basically got a bit lost along, along the way and found myself in Baghdad uh, as the bombs were sort of going off, which, which is another story. You, you quite, know how to pick the locations. <laughs> <don't you? laughs> I went right when I should have gone left. Um, so, you know, I'd always had this fascination with, with the Middle East. And so I thought for the, for the next trip, I'm going to go for what is potentially the most challenging, controversial, difficult region anywhere on earth, which is, of course, the Arabian Peninsula, and that's what I chose for the next expedition. And this is uh, this is what's coming out. This yeah. is the new series that's coming out on the twenty seventh, twenty seventh of June, coming up. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, I thought, why not really try to challenge people's preconceived ideas? Because I think if you think of if you say the word Arabia or the Middle East, it's generally the domain of the new channels, isn't it? It's bombs going off, it's terrorism, and that's something I wanted to to challenge. I wanted to look at the Middle East from a very different lens rather than looking at it from a news perspective or a, or a sort of war reporter going there with no agenda, no, no, no preconceived ideas and just seeing what it was like. Um, so I basically decided to do a, a full circumnavigation of the Arabian Peninsula, um, starting on the Syria-Iraq border. This was um, basically the, the, the tail end of when ISIS was still in control of those areas. Uh, travel all the way through Iraq, uh, around the Gulf states, uh, through Yemen, uh, and then all the way up the west side as well, through Saudi Arabia into the Holy Lands. And then finishing almost a sort of come full circle on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea in Lebanon, which was really close to where I finished the, the Caucasus trip. So it was a real challenge because it took about 12 to 18 months of planning just to get the the, the sort of the route nailed down to, to, to sort of start getting access to places. You're doing this with a team, I assume. 
So to do this, um, that's a lot of this planning. was a lot of planning. I, I had to get a really good team on board. So I got two of my mates from the army who, who both got a lot of experience in the Middle East. Um, and they came board on board as sort of co-producers and they kind of knew their way around a camera as well. And, and yeah, we, we, we came up with this idea. Everyone said that it was absolutely bonkers. Everyone said that we'd probably die. Um, but actually, with the right amount of planning, um, we, we somehow managed to pull it off. And it was, I think, you know, to date, my most ambitious journey so far. We went straight in at the deep end, Syria, Iraq. You know, uh, we <laughs> I, won't, I won't spoil it too much, but, you know, that we see quite a bit of fighting. And, you know, it's... That was inevitable because we. I chose to start up in the in the right in in the mix. What you'll find with the rest of the series is that actually, I, I look at lots of different themes, which is the the incredible hospitality, the life of the Bedouin in the desert, the some of the mega cities that you find along the route as well, and of course the the legacy of of the amazing history of the region. So the, there's a real sense of diversity I feel with this one. Um, it is of course. A big, you know, it's a big adventure through some pretty inhospitable terrain, um, crossing places like the Empty Quarter Desert, but lots of interesting run-ins with with all sorts of different people. You know, pirates in the Arabian Sea, various armed groups along the way. Uh, you know, plenty of wildlife, you know, too as well. But it was it was just a for me um, something that I think people will watch it and they'll be like, wow, I never knew that about the Middle East. In terms of the, the history that you go through, you see it in all of your books, and obviously it is a passion of yours, the history. Do you do most of your research before you go, or when you come back, do you look at when you're writing a book, do you then do research after? Because you can't obviously know everything that you no. on your trip. No. I mean, it's a bit of both, really. I mean, it's obviously I, I'll refer to my sort of previous knowledge of having studied the region, but... But yeah, I'll, you know, I'll do my homework before we go. You need to, you need to know kind of obviously the route and which way. And uh, but what I'd like to do as well with these with these journeys, this one in particular, was look at the the route that I was taking. And if there were previous explorers, whether that's Wilfred Thesiger, or Richard Button, who went to certain places, try and follow in, you know, follow their routes as well. Lawrence of Arabia, I went to see his, you know, his trains in Saudi Arabia, which are still there in the middle of the desert. He blew them up a hundred years ago. Um, so it, it's, it's weaving them in and this isn't, you know, it's not heavy on the history. I don't think it's just great to be able to, to hopefully people will be like, wow, you know, that's really interesting because, um, there is an amazing legacy there and, um, it is making that accessible. It's, it's, it, this isn't boring history. This is stuff that is having a, a massive impact on the world today so that you've got to, you can't just over, overlook that. It's important to, to incorporate that into the journey. For me, it was uh, one of the things that I, I first noticed uh, watching and reading the, the, your early adventures was how you managed to, to to weave an interesting historical narrative through it while still keeping it very entertaining, which I, ha I hadn't really at that point in time seen uh, seen that. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I very much view, I've, I feel very privileged to be able to do what I do, right? So I think it would be a crying shame not to be able to bring in and weave in some of these themes that, that I'm passionate about and which hopefully people will learn something from, whether that's about conservation or history or culture, um, into the story. And I think as long as you don't lay it on too thick, people will learn about stuff without, you know, f nodding off to sleep. <laughs> Maybe you won't be able to tell us because uh, obviously we've only seen that episode one, so I don't know what's happening after the, the first episode of the new series. Uh, but in terms of close calls with death, which seems to be every location you pick to go. <laughs> now, um, I've written a car crash on here. Right, where was that now? I can't that was in the Himalayas. That was in the Himalayas. That was in Nepal, yeah. I mean, that was obviously... I mean, it's bizarre, isn't it? You go to all these places, you get shot at and have spears thrown at you and snapped at by crocodiles. And the one thing that actually was but probably the most dangerous was getting in a car. I know. Um, but no, on, on, on this latest journey, um, there's lots of close shaves. Um, we, we do get involved. You know, we see some pretty heavy fighting in, in Iraq. We go to a lot of the war zones. We go to Syria. We go to the city of Homs. We go to Mosul in Iraq. Uh, Yemen, you know, was completely sealed off when we went. So I won't spoil it, but there was there was an interesting escape there. Um, I mean, for me, it kind of, it, it almost felt like this surreal experience of being in an action movie, but for real. For five it's months. Because it's around you. Because it's around you, yeah. I mean, how do you... 
how do you process that in your mind? Because now you're there as a, an observer, essentially telling a story, which is very, very different to when you would have been in similar locations in the military. Yeah. How do you rationalize that in your head in terms of the the risk level? Because, I mean, you, from what I've seen in the first episode, you're, you know, the bullets are flying. Yeah, we were on the front line, you know, like it, it was, it was, it was very, very, um, it was a visceral experience. What I would say, though, is that having been in the military, having been on front lines around the world before, you kind of know where to draw the line, so to speak. You know what's an acceptable level of risk. Um, from the from, I suppose the the layperson's viewpoint, if you see bloody hell, what do you, you know? What's going on here? You're, you're you're there and on the front line. There's bullets whizzing over your head. That's ridiculous. That that's that's reckless. Actually, we weren't being reckless at all. I think. Because we knew what to do in those situations, where the, the the where ISIS was, which way we were getting shot at, that you know there are ways to mitigate those risks. Um, certainly, we were we were on the winning side. Put it that way. We you know I was with this this militia force of about two hundred vehicles, armed to the teeth. You know they were always going to win. Not to mention helicopter support, artillery. Um, these these guys were were basically rolling over the ISIS villages. Um, so you'd be very unlucky to, to sort of cop a bullet on that, you know, really. Um, but you know, these, these are expeditions. They're not without risks, of course. Um, but yeah, I was with a very experienced couple of guys, my mates from the army who, who know what they're doing, fully trained up from a medical perspective. And for me, you know, this is my day job. I've been doing this, you know, for, for, as long as I can remember. Um, and I knew that to get this, whilst it was the most ambitious expedition to date, I knew that if anyone could do it, it was me and, and, and my couple of mates that we've, we've put together to, to, to make this team. And so um, actually, you know, when you, when you sort of look at it rationally and, and, and look at all the different factors involved and make sure you get the right people on side, and I mean the locals as well, then you can kind of make it happen. And we were able to, because we had the sort of freedom to do this, we were able to really push the boundaries and do something which I don't think any other, you know, documentary makers have done in a very long time. This is breaking new ground from uh, from an expeditionary point of view, but also from from filmmaking point of view. You know, we were embedded with all sorts of groups. We were, we had lunch with Hezbollah. Um, we met, you know, ISIS captives. We were with the, some of the Shia militias. We were in Yemen with the rebels. Uh, we were in the Southern Saudi Arabia with, with these tribesmen. I mean, it was, it was really, really fascinating. Um, what I would say is the way, the style of the filmmaking is subtle. You know, I, we don't go with you know, big sound booms and, and, and mirrors and lights and all the rest of it. It's literally just, you know, two or three guys on the ground, um, sometimes just me with a local with a small camera. And not covert, we weren't sort of hiding cameras or anything. But, you know, actually, if you go there and you explain what you're doing, often people are quite understanding. And for them, um, particularly in the more remote areas who they might not have seen any Westerners in, in a long time, certainly none with a camera, for them, it's a great opportunity to tell their own story to you know obviously you know everyone's got an agenda and you're going to be a bit careful don't believe everything that everyone's saying but it's it's about giving people a voice that, that wouldn't otherwise have a voice and Yemen was a case in point you know I wanted to go to Yemen not just to get in but but really this was a country that you know no foreigners even journalists NGO aid workers had all been thrown out of two and a half years previously so there was no information coming out of Yemen and there was a huge humanitarian crisis there was a big refugee crisis there was cholera you know a big civil war and and all of this completely is, is bypassed the the media so I I saw it as my responsibility and duty to go in there and and give a voice to the people that I met. And um, they were more than happy to be filmed. It's amazing how uh, willing people are to tell their stories. Yeah. Uh, how did you, how did they react to you in terms of what they thought you were doing? Did they think you were crazy? A lot of the, the oh, absolutely. people there. Yeah, yeah. People, people, you know, initially when they, when they really, they said, you know, are you a spy? You say no. Then they say, okay, are you? So you got asked that straight to oh, your face. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then they say, okay, are you Are ISIS? you a spy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then they ask you if you're ISIS and you say, no, we're not ISIS either. And then they get a bit confused and then they say, okay, are you, are you you know, are you a journalist? And we like, well, not really. We're just on a journey. And, and this is what I'm here to. I'm on a journey, on an expedition to to tell people's stories with no idea, no, no, um, no agenda, no, no 
sort of forcing a narrative. It was very much, we're here to see what the reality of life is like for you. And then when they, then they sort of breathe this sigh of relief and they're like, okay, let me show you my house. It's always amazing to see how welcoming people are in other parts of the world because uh, me and Byron were discussing we were in the car we're right here. If someone knocked on the door in the northeast of Scotland, the likelihood is they're probably not going to give you the bed for the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite staggering just how hospitable people are. I mean, I was invited into people's homes, people's caves. I mean, I, I stayed, literally stayed in the Bedouin caves. Um, uh, anywhere, people were just so welcoming. Um, what do you think? What is that? What is the difference? Because that doesn't really happen. There might be the odd kind soul, but it happens with such frequency in the places mm. and, the, and the stories that you've told in the past. What is the difference? Well, I think certainly in that part of the world, there is there's such a culture of hospitality. There's uh, you know there's a it's almost a duty in certainly within Islam within Bedouin culture, you know, which predates Islam. If you, if a stranger crosses into your, the threshold of your home, you're duty bound to look after that person. And not only that, protect them, feed them, give them water. Even if your their neighbors want to harm you, it's their duty to protect you against them. And, and that's a, that's a very ingrained mentality. Uh, and so, and, and even now it, it's still, I mean, you don't really get it in the cities. If you just turn up at Dubai you're not going to get invited no. if it's somebody's flat. But if you go 10 miles out into the desert, you will. And that's, it's still, it's a very rural mentality. Um, it's a desert mentality, but it, it still exists in, in, you know, in droves all the way across the Middle East. Some places more than others, but, um, but yeah, well, I was never, never really, never thrown out of anywhere, never booted out or told to go somewhere else. It was always, once you had explained who you were and they realized that you're not a threat or, or anything like that, then people were, were generally very welcoming. People are probably going to want to know what kind of kit you take on uh, a trip like that, particularly uh, listeners from our show. Because it doesn't look like a lot, if I'm honest. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, the good thing about, you know, going on a, a desert journey like that is you don't really need much kit because... Um, Generally, it was was pretty hot. I mean, it was very hot to start with because I started in September, and uh, you know, it, it was yeah, it was really hot in the desert. It does get quite cold at night, so you know, I was carrying a sort of uh, a sleeping bag liner. Um, I was generally just wearing whatever the locals wore, and that would mean a jella beer or a dishdasha or you know, and a, a sort of. Uh, a, a, a turban on your head just to keep the sun off, you know. So it was it was pretty lightweight and. You know, and then you'd move on to another country where there was a different dress code, and so you'd you know you'd chuck that away and, and buy a new one, and 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 that was it. You know, that's that's all you needed really. Um, as the journey progressed and winter sort of set in, um, I got to I got to the Holy Lands, I got to Bethlehem just in time for Christmas Day, um, which was quite amazing actually, because we went to the, the Church of the Nativity for and had Christmas. We had a uh, Christmas lunch uh, in Bethlehem. Um, no that's, turkey. Uh, that's a bit surreal. There was a kebab shop. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and that was, that was it. That was very, very bizarre. But, but then it was started getting colder as we went into Syria. So we needed, you know, a bit more warm kit, but you don't need very much at all. You know, obviously the, the heaviest bit was, was carrying cameras and, and things like that. When you see how some people are kitted out, it's uh, when I see the, uh, the limited stuff that you have. On we didn't your take, I didn't take a tent the whole yeah. way around. You know, we, we had a blanket with just a local blanket that you buy for, you know, no five, sleeping five mat, quid. no pillow, just a blanket. Just a blanket, and because you, you know, a lot of the time you're on in, you know, on sand, or if you're invited to people's homes, then they they will give you a blanket. So, I didn't need a tent. Um, you, you sleep outside in the desert, and it was great. A lot of people are pretty pessimistic about the kind of state of the world globally. But being somebody who's you know travelled so much of it, and in particularly the, the places that people would hold up as, you know conflict areas within them and between countries. What is your kind of view of the future of the world, if I can put it as grandly as that? So, you know, there are obviously tragic conflicts going on, Syria being case in point. Um, and, you know, that one should never under, underestimate that, you know, big civil war, you know, hundreds of thousands of people killed and displaced. But when you put it in perspective to previous times, let's say, we've never had it so good. We really haven't. You know, we when you compare it to the Second World War or the First World War or the, you know, hundreds of other wars that, that, that occurred throughout the 19th century, the, the tribal wars that, that occurred across the world um, before the sort of modern era, we 
fewer people die a violent death now than ever before in history. We've got to remember that because... It's easy to forget. It's easy to forget. And so whilst we hear all this stuff on the media about, oh, it's terrible and this, that and the other, it really isn't. You know, we've, we've, we've almost, you know, there is poverty out there, there's lots of it, but there's also, you know, millions, if not billions of people being drawn out of poverty, um, you know, into, into a relatively stable, safe and, uh, you know, prosperous existence. So I think it's, it's important to try and counter the narrative that you always get, which bad news obviously sells, but it's important to show people that actually, in my experience has been that wherever you go in the world, people are generally pretty good and will look after you and, uh, and actually aren't that bothered about politics and, uh, you know, religion and, and a lot of the other issues that, that, that are surrounding the conflicts that, that happen. So that's very much at the core of all the adventures. That you yeah, have. it has been. And, uh, and I try and show that, you know, I'm sure that there'll be lots of people that will disagree with me and that's fine too. But the facts remain that we've never really had it so good. Um, so the biggest problem is, of course, um, the fact that there's there's a lot of people on the planet, you know, and even in my lifetime, the, the human population has almost doubled. There was something like 4.7 billion people on the planet in, you know, 1982. Now there's, I think, 7.7 billion people. Now that's the root of all the problems in the world is, is the fact that there are, um, you know, the, the human population is is growing so quickly that there aren't... Enough um, resources. For well, the, the, the resources are there. It's just the competition for them has grown to the point where we don't have a system in place to allocate the resources fairly and equally. Um, you know, with the right systems in place, with the right technologies, everybody could get fed. But at the moment, the system on which we operate doesn't allow for that, if that makes sense. It certainly doesn't allow for... Um, other species to to thrive properly, which is why we have human wildlife conflicts um, across places like Africa. I mean, the, the African population is going to set to double by 2050. That's a scary thought if you th consider how difficult the balance is already, already is between I mean, wildlife and humans. You know, the current rate of um, poaching of elephants, for example, um, is is disastrous. Uh, you know, it's 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 uh, you know if if the current rate of poach, uh, rate of poaching doesn't decline, then elephants could be extinct in the wild in the next decade. That's a scary thought. Which is a scary thought. There's only twenty five thousand lions left in in Africa. It's not nothing, is it? Really. So, uh, and the more people there are, and if people um, in in certain regions continue to have seven, eight, nine, ten children, you know, this is growing at such a rate that there simply won't be any land left for for wildlife to to survive and do you see that as uh, primarily an, an education issue? absolutely it's education i mean you know it's it's we we, we go on and we, we we get sort of hung up about certain issues which are all important whether that's plastic in the oceans or whether that's making sure we we we, we have cardboard straws these, these are all these are all very important things that we should we should address, but it only actually affects a tiny proportion of humanity. You know, it's in the in in the developed world. Let's say you know, if if um, a few a minuscule amount of people make those changes, it doesn't make a blind bit of difference. What you need to have is that effect going across the world, and that's education, um, particularly female education. That's that's probably the most important issue, especially in underdeveloped countries. Be because that you know, if you can keep girls in school for an extra few years, they will you know, by default, have fewer children. I know that you've got um, a new expedition coming up, which you can't tell us anything about. But apart from that, is there any other things uh, that you're involved in, either sort of smaller things that, that's going on that you can tell people about? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm involved. Um, conservation's a, you know, a key topic of mine. I'm involved with a couple of conservation charities, primarily the Tusk Trust in Africa, who do amazing work. Um, they just uh, got a bunch of new Land Rovers, I think. To go yeah, that's them, right. right. Yeah. And I might actually see in the DRC, I'm, I'm going out to the DRC with UNICEF. Oh. Um, um, as well, I'm going to speak to you about that offline later in the year. Um, I've got a children's book coming out actually um, in well this week. Yeah. What's that about? It's called Incredible Journeys, um, and it's basically uh, hopefully will inspire the next generation of explorers. Out There's there. a little cartoon characters of you in it. There's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's about uh, the sort of figures from history. So it's everything from um, you know Marco Polo. So they're going to learn. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's about hist history and exploration and uh, all the way through to the present present day and, and how to be an explorer yourself. I think I'm going to have to give that a read myself. <laughs> it's aimed at seven plus, but you might be well, right. He's in the plus part of it. <laughs> um, what is your, um, how, how long have you been involved with Tusk? Um, and just, just if you've got a minute, it would be 
interesting just to elaborate on that a little bit. It's not an organization that we've really talked about on the sure. podcast before. Yeah. I mean, so I've been involved uh, ever since the Nile, actually, when I did the Nile expedition, I visited a few of their projects on the ground. Um, the gorilla conservation in um, in Uganda, chimpanzee conservation in Rwanda, elephant projects all the way through uh, Tanzania and in Uganda as well. Um, and, and over the last five or six years, I, I've been out to Africa several times, different parts. I was in Kenya last year running the Lewa half marathon, which is a great half marathon. You can run through a national park in Northern Kenya, which is brilliant. And all of the proceeds go to support conservation there. Um, and yeah, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a great charity. They support lots of projects all the way across Africa, particularly you mentioned pangolins. Mm -hmm. they, they're very um, big on that. Um, they've got um, Prince William as their, as their patron. So they, they're getting more traction. Um, they're trying to go to the root causes of, of the issues. They go do a lot of work in the Far East and uh, China and Vietnam, but also, uh, you know, talking about the, the stuff that we talked about before in terms of education and community engagement, really, that's where the that's where the big changes need to happen. Mm, yeah, we, I just spent a bit of time now in um, in the north of Namibia in one of the uh, community-run conservancies and learning about their balance and the utilization of wildlife so that there is a place for both humans yeah. and wildlife in those well, areas. People need to feel invested, don't yeah. they? they? There needs to be a value um and people need to see the, the benefit of, of protecting the wildlife because if they don't, then... So if they're getting something back yeah. out of it. So that, that particular place was a mix of like 70% tourism and then 30% hunting, but it was all run by the local communities. Yeah. And it was uh, yeah, it was an interesting conversation to have with them. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's you know, it's, I think it's very important. And uh, the only way to do it is to is to spread the word and, uh, and, and hopefully people will, will take an interest. Um, just to recap on the series that you have coming out. So as I said before, it's out on the 27th, airing where, what time? It's on Discovery Channel at... <laughs> I was, I was wondering yeah, nice what time is it? Nine o'clock? Is that? Ten o'clock. Yes. Yeah. Nine o'clock. It's on, it's on at nine o'clock on Discovery Channel. It's a five part series um, and it's, it's going to be great. I cannot wait to see the rest of it. Fantastic. Thank Ellison, you. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been Hope great enjoy to see you. It. Cheers. And that's it for another two weeks. Now, if you have been listening for the last couple of shows, thank you. But uh, what I was going to say is that we have been mentioning about the Gallic whiskies and gin whiskey hunt. And I hid a little miniature with a treasure thing in it uh, two weeks ago now. Within 48 hours, with one clue, it had been found. <laughs> I think Bear by mind, accident. It was up a mountain. And in Glencoe. In Glencoe. Oh, it was near a relatively... I mean, I can tell you the location, actually. It was at the top of the ski centre. So you had to get to the... Basically, either take the chairlift up or walk up. Uh, and uh, it was... You know, it was under rocks and stuff. So it was relatively hard to find. And, yeah, it was found within 48 hours with one clue. And literally all they had was... It must have been an accident because the the clue only gave them the location of Glen yeah. Co. I think they were probably adding to the care, and I yeah, think. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but there will be another uh, competition going out in the next week or so. Yeah. So, so keep your eye out for that. Gallic whiskies and gins on Instagram and Facebook. If you like whiskey, it's worthwhile. And if you live in Scotland or traveling to Scotland, you might find a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. And then you'll be winning. Remember... You can listen to the show on loads of different platforms. I have just purchased a brand new phone that is not an Apple phone, uh, which I'm still figuring out how to use. So I'm a way to figure out the best way to listen to podcasts on that today. But I imagine I'll probably just use Spotify uh, if that is not working too well. Because now I'm with Android people. So now that I can test these things properly and see what's working, what's not working. And then Byron can test the Apple things. Yeah. So now we've, we've got the best of both worlds. And, uh, yeah, so Spotify or iTunes is the, is, sorry, not iTunes, it's called Apple Podcasts. Oh, yeah, they've changed it. Apparently they're, they're, the, they're disbanding iTunes. It's iTunes on my phone. Is that, is I think in the next it? update. Oh, okay. Uh, they're going to disband iTunes and then just have podcasts and the App Store or something crazy like that. I don't know. I think, I think they found that people aren't buying music anymore. They're just streaming it. Hmm. So they've 
there's no point. As long as people can still listen to our yeah, podcast. Exactly. Who cares? As long as people listen to the, the podcast. Don't forget to um, take part in the competitions, both to win a copy of Modern Huntsman and uh, for the Hornady um, baseball caps as well, which are all going to be on social media. Um, if you want to um, help support the show, go and visit Patreon. And thanks to everyone that is a patron yep. right now. Uh, if you want to contact the show, it is podcast at paceproductionsuk.com or all the W's, the pacebrothers.com, and then you can get all the information you need there. And on social media, we are very active on Instagram, which is just pace underscore brothers. And you will hear from us again in two weeks' time. Yeah.